Hello, everybody. My name is Nicole Gervasio, and I'm a PhD candidate in English at Columbia University right now. I'm also really excited to be here because I graduated from Bryn Mawr in 2010, um, so I haven't been back since. It's a nice return. And I'm here to talk to you today about, primarily about a digital learning tool um, that I use uh, in my classroom to annotate visual texts. Um, and I'm going to talk about it in terms of the multidisciplinary work I do with teaching a lot of core courses in Columbia's curriculum. Um, currently, the Literature Humanities course, which is pretty much the literary analog to the case to cathedrals class that Gretchen was just talking about. Except we say antiquity to Tony Morrison. Okay, so here are a few goals that I have for our presentation today. Okay, one, uh, the first few goals are maybe semi self indulgent. I want to take a little bit of time to frame teaching canonical literature as a critical engagement with power, which I think is maybe an unconventional way to deal with it. And then I want to move into making a case for why bridging visual and textual literacy actually aids students' development, um, not only in understanding these texts, but also in being attached to them in a way that has contemporary repercussions for the way that they interact with their own cultural imaginary. Uh, at that third juncture, I will introduce MediaThread, the tool itself that Columbia, um, Columbia Center for Teaching and Learning has designed it and developed it. I should say I'm a user, not a developer, so if you have questions about the nitty gritty parts of the tool, I'll do my best to answer them but I might not know as much as an actual educational technologist. And then fourth, um, I have a lot of results to show you to prove the efficacy of the blended learning strategy and the way that it's worked across two uh, canonical course, courses, one at Columbia and the other one um, at Barter across the street. So here's my so what. Um, I'm very adamant that we shouldn't only be reading these great books because they're great books, but actually because the structures of power embedded within them encourage social and political recognition or discourage it for certain groups of people. And I really try to hammer home to my students that they're reading all the time, even if they don't realize it. An advertisement is a piece of literature. A course guide is a piece of literature. A course description is a piece of literature. And so I encourage them to think more structurally about texts um, because most of my students are taking these courses because they have to. Very few of them are um, English majors or ever will become English majors. In fact, sometimes they become English majors because they like my class, and then I feel a little bit guilty about <laughs> what kind of path I set them into. Um, so this is one of the questions I animate this literature with. Uh, how is it participating in the construction of the cultural imaginary? And whose moral universe is at stake within the literature as it is being described? Um, whose presences are completely elided, even as we know that in actuality they must have existed in that place of time? Um, so this is one of the... It's one half of an advertisement I show them at the beginning of the semester to make them think twice about the extent to which certain associations of good and evil are embedded within certain kinds of stereotypes. So I just want everyone to take a second, and whether you do this with dread or disgust or just confusion, um, think about what might be on the other half of this advertisement. <laughs> and then think about the extent to which this completely deleterious and inaccurate dichotomy is embedded within so many of these classical texts that were made to teach um, in courses that sort of take an uncritical view towards questions of race, sexuality, and gender. It's an ad for a uh, clothing company, United Colors of Canon. So specifically for teaching the canon, I also apologize that there's, <laughs> I have this, uh, <laughs> The Washington Post um, update that a widget lets me know what's going on. <laughs> All right, so specifically for teaching the canon, uh, the problem isn't that otherness is completely absent. The problem is that we're not actually primed to read the presence of that other when it appears to be missing because we always already approach dominant narratives in hegemonic terms. So what I wanted to look at was the ways in which blended learning methods could sideline these dominant narratives by really forcing students to literally look at the problems as they exist, like we just did with that advertisement. So one solution, I think, is to pluralize the very concept of literacies in the classroom, make it clear that there are multiple interpretive methods for looking at any object, and that it's not just about reading literature as literature, um, but as a cultural artifact that exists in the world and has an impact. Um, I wanted to see how I could make the invisible visible, the absent present, so that questions about race, class, gender, sexuality are completely, are completely relevant and not actually just um, esoteric to my personal hobby horse. Um, and so last, I wanted to look at visual analogs uh, and the ways in which they can challenge a students' preconceived notions and inherited ideas because 
So the vast majority of first-year students don't actually know that the knowledge they've inherited, the ideas they have, are not theirs. Uh, so part of the work I do is teaching them that they don't need to think everything they think they know. So here we get to media, the tool itself. It's an open source digital annotation tool, um, and it allows you to basically bookmark. Um, there's a bookmarklet tool that you can add as a widget onto your computer that will clip um, images and film clips from places like YouTube, Flickr, etc. Um, and then students can have the opportunity to annotate uh, those materials with selections once they have been added to the collection for their media print course. So I'm going to show you what that actually looks like here. Um, I'm going to show this again at the end, but this is the quick link uh, if you're interested in finding out more about this tool and how you might be able to use it in your own institution. And this is basically a very quick review of what it looks like on the page. So on the left, you'll see that there's a place for um, instructors to put um, directions for homework. I usually include a bit of background. You can include hypertext, um, hyperlinks, etc. <coughs> um, the middle here is the image itself. So one of the ways that I get them to think critically is by um, sort of deconstructing some of the juicier book covers on our syllabus. And so this is the book cover for our copy of um, The Divine Comedy by the Inferno. And on the right, students' um, responses come up and they adhere to like different blocks of text. Right now, I chose the view that allows you to see all of them at once. All right, so why is this important? Um, I strongly believe that by being made to take a closer look at these texts, we can discern a number of questions um, and allusions that we might not have noticed the first time. Uh, for example, here we have uh, the black body demon stepping on the uh, subservient white man's back. And I ask them to think about what kind of message that is sending about um, power dynamics here and what's good and what's evil. If you want to find women in the painting, the only way that you can find women in this cover is if you look for the people who don't have faces. Um, and not only do they not have faces, but they're also extremely sexualized in nature. Um, and then lastly, I have them ask themselves how the demons themselves are racialized. The ways in which these images, especially this one down here, perpetuates the notion that there's something bestial or animalistic about um, these demons of a different skin. So, in doing that, you can also, therefore, um, you know, sort of in this <coughs> moment, where they see the kind of strategic choices that have gone into choosing the book cover. Um, if you'll notice, the book cover itself is only right here, this portion of this giant triptych from Hans Memling. Um, and so then we have a conversation about what that means, that, you know, they purposely chose, the editors of Phantom, chose this for what they wanted to represent the Inferno as opposed to any other point. Okay, so now we get to the proven measurable results section. I just, I have no idea what's going on in this kid, but the kids seem to be happy about you know, whatever he's achieved there. <laughs> okay, um, so this is for my barter class. There are two different assignments that I have put my students through. One uh, in the barter class was a conversation essay that invited them to go to the Met. Although you can also do this in a remote way by using the Met's online search tool, which is extremely good. Um, all you have to do is go to the view of the collection link and then look for artwork either on display or just in general. Um, and it's very good with terms like uh, any Greek mythological character, um, you know, uh, certain kinds of cultural references, etc. So they had to go to the Met. They were assigned a piece of artwork that I had already um, uh, found myself that had to do with something we read in class. Then they had to annotate it um, with MediaThread and come in for a class presentation on that artwork to their peers. And in their rough draft for their paper, the conversation essay, they had to find a way to bring the art into conversation with um, the text that they decided to do their paper <coughs> on. So, um, these are some results I found, was that it certainly did improve critical thinking to bridge visual and textual literacy for these students. 32% use visual or textual quotes reading in their introductions for the rough drafts. Mm -hmm. It may not seem very like a huge statistic for a third of them to have done this, but in fact, it was a quite bold move because to do a close reading of a visual representation was something that they had never done in their five paragraph model essay from high school. And so this was really an opportunity for that daring third um, to be more creative and be rewarded for it. And then 92% of students in the end ranked learning about visual and textual strategies for academic rating 
to being extremely to moderately useful. So these collapsed in that are the four um, collapsed in that are like four different grades. I gave them for like extremely moderately, um, you know, uh, decent, etc. So that's the vast majority of the class having enjoyed this. <laughs> Um, they also left with an increased sense of ownership over the material. There's a few statistics for you here, too. So, uh, when they gave these in-class presentations, I was really surprised that none of the students ended up reading from the homework assignment that they had already crafted on media print. I told them they could if they were nervous about it. But instead, they just ended up sort of um, extemporizing on connections they saw between uh, their literary text and the visual source in ways that some of them had never extemporized on the literary source at all in any like regular classroom discussion. It really seemed like they felt they knew the material better by nature of having made these connections. And even more impressively, in my opinion, 75% of students chose to feature other students' artworks instead of their own. So it wasn't that they had just gotten to know something that related to a text that they found interesting. It was that then they totally scrapped that and decided to go with something they saw in class that they thought was more akin to their own research interests. So this is just an example of one, um, one student's introduction. This is one of the students who took um, this image from the, it's from the head of a sarcophagus, and it's an Ethiop and a Maenad uh, sort of entwined together, um, God knows why. And so she came with, up with this argument for God knows why. Uh, named the Ethiopian Menad, the sculpture presents two figures who, while physically close, harbor a great emotional distance. While there are no Ethiopians in the Bakai, this figure represents the racialized other. In the Asian chorus, otherwise known as the Bakai, devout followers of the god Dionysus, the god of wine. Similarly, the Menad represents the other ostracized group of women in the play, the crazed, sexualized women possessed by Dionysus. In the sculpture, the Menad's arms serve carelessly in the space between the two figures, increasing the figurative distance between them and clearly demonstrating a desire for the two to disidentify from one another. This separation exemplifies the ideals of Hepius, the ruler of Thebes, who views the Maenads, the Bacchae, and their mixing as threats to the social order and integrity of the city. So that is the place where the student was able to make the leap um, from what she had seen at the Met into something that had interested her in the text. And now I have a completely different set of assignments to introduce you to for my literature and humanities class this year. Um, this just gives you an idea of the variety of assignments that we use media thread for in terms of enlivening um, the Bible, the Bacchae again, um, and Jane Austen with a clip from Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, a spectacular film. <coughs> and then their final project, which is the more exciting part. Um, I had them create a class zine. Uh, if you're not familiar, zines are basically like grassroots DIY literary magazines that can also be about politics or really anything. Um, and having done all of this multidisciplinary work throughout the year, because I have these kids all year, um, the same students, if they choose to stay with me in the spring, which they did, uh, I give them the opportunity to entertain, teach, or inform us, uh, meaning that they can do creative writing, something pedagogical, where there's something they learned that they want to teach to readers, or something interdisciplinary, where there's um, something lurking in the background of the historical or political context of the text that we didn't get to flesh out in class, but they want to take responsibility for. So you've already seen um, The Inferno. I just wanted to bring this one up. This, um, like one of the benefits of teaching this class is that I have students who have never thought about feminism or intersectionality critically, and I get to um, introduce them to it in a way that doesn't need to mention any of those terms at all. But then you also always have um, your inherently rapidly feminist students. Um, and so I sort of appreciated this particular tag that Jennifer added, uh, which is never trash. <laughs> but, you know, and so it's also an opportunity to um, bring Jennifer into a conversation where we talk about, yes, how humor is always good on some level, but it's also important uh, to maintain a certain level of critical, um, critical reaction to one's own biases. So that was an example of a student thinking about sexuality, the question I brought up earlier. This is a student um, thinking about the question of race. And there were two things about her quotes that I really appreciated. One is that she actually acknowledged the fact that the demons are not necessarily just blackened, they're also really greened. Um, and it was interesting because I had never expected this to come up as an analog when we talk about Toni Morrison 
she has this whole uh, paragraph in Song of Solomon where she's like, you know, anyone who thinks black is just black is closed-minded and like not really seeing what black is. You know, you would never have a green bottle and say that every green is the same. Um, and so we were able to like bring that idea back and think about like what it means to be green with envy, um, green with, uh, you know, sort of like the opposite, verger and exuberance, like we see um, in Genesis. So this is a picture that I had seen uh, by Deanna Lawson, uh, who was an African-American photographer in the Whitney earlier in the year. Um, and I wanted to bring it into you here to show you that sometimes what you'll end up getting uh, is something that you perceive to be sort of fundamental about thinking about race in the classroom. Like this student, for example, ended up having some, you know, very, um, you know, very basic comments to make about how struck he was to see Adam and Eve here racialized, but that was partially because he had never seen a representation of Adam and Eve as such, as a person of color himself. Um, here, uh, this is an example of a student, I know these are very long, it's not possible to copy and paste media threads, so that's why I just included them in full as uh, pictures. Um, but he's thinking about knowledge and nudity and how we discussed in class that it's not sexuality per se that's stigmatized in that moment of original sin. It's the idea of being completely vulnerable to oneself, being naked. And so these are just two examples of um, two students who ended up, like many others, focusing on the belly um, and the extent to which there's like something protective going on here, the implication that maybe Eve is already pregnant. Um, and this ends up coming up again in Paradise Lost when Milton is constantly focusing on the snake crawling on his belly across the world. Uh, so we were able to drive these really like peculiar connections I don't think I would have seen otherwise. Um, this just gives you an example of the triptych they're looking at for the Bacchae. Um, so this is Cindy Sherman as Bacchus, this is Caravaggio as Bacchus, and this is just a uh, ordinary woman of color who decided to uh, take a picture of herself as Bacchus in the vein of these other two. Um, this is another example of something I had never noticed before thanks to doing this project. Uh, I had had a student who self-described himself as fairly standard and white male. Um, and he ended up focusing on the presence, um, even in Caravaggio's painting of the peaches, uh, the femininity that's present there, um, even as the text itself you know, doesn't give you a whole lot of opportunity to discuss these questions. So last, I just have a few examples to show you from uh, the zine that they created, which one of the privileges of working at Columbia is that there's a uh, archive of bar art for zines. Um, and so they can get it entered into the library catalog once they finish. I apologize for speeding through them. I only have a minute left. But this uh, was a student who rewrote the gospel to include Jesus uh, committing a sin of a sexual nature. Um, he had grown up in a very repressive Catholic household, and he really wanted to like rewrite the tradition so that he could keep his faith. This is a student who took the interdisciplinary route of looking up more about the yellow card uh, in the history of Russian um, prostitution when we read Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. And she actually ended up relating it to carding practices that still exist today, like the yellow card that's used for Muslim immigrants. Um, this student, let's see, oh, the, some of my favorites are based on Montaigne. Uh, this student wrote an essay called On Columbia University in Montaigne's voice, like on abstraction of some kind. Um, and he wrote it from the perspective of being a first generation Navajo student uh, and comparing the behavior of his peers to those of cannibals. This is also a, uh, another comparison between on predators, it's called, and on cannibals. Um, and this is the last real thing I have to show you, which is just how these essays look if you use the composition function on MediaThread, where students can write their essay in one box and link specific annotations that they've made uh, where they matter. Okay, so this is just all the stuff that you need to know for using MediaThread if you want to yourself. Um, it's been adopted institution-wide at MIT, Dartmouth, Wellesley actually, um, and the University of Maine. Um, but do make sure um, that you know how to use the tool before you send your students to use it, because it's a little bit janky, um, and students can get very easily frustrated if they don't understand how the selection pieces work, because they just want to get their homework done. Um, if you're interested, Cannon Fodder, the uh, literary magazine they created, is also available online. And otherwise, thank you. Okay.